Hey, good afternoon. This is Jay Frost speaking to you from delightfully sunny but still chilly Virginia uh, with uh, over there in Maryland, uh, uh, our uh, sturdy uh, executive producer here, Hannah Krobach at the controls. And we're both very happy to welcome you to another in this series of flash classes brought to you, of course, by DonorSearch, which you can find out more about at DonorSearch.net. But as you know, if you've attended these before, and there have been now over 170 of these sessions since mid-2016, uh, you won't be hearing much about donor search, if anything at all. Uh, donor search is providing this platform to have a discussion with leaders in the field, uh, top speakers and presenters in the field of fundraising and philanthropy. We are certainly doing that again today. And uh, so this is an opportunity to bring those people to you to talk about the issues of importance to them and to us. And, uh, and we're delighted you can be here to join us. The next couple of minutes, of course, will be a bit of housekeeping as I reintroduce the platform we'll be using. Uh, how you can get the slides and the recording after the fact, how you can engage with the speaker during the session. Um, so if you've heard all this before, feel free to use this as a moment to gather your friends around your favorite electronic device, uh, get something nice to drink and make yourself comfortable. But if you have missed this before, I wanna encourage you to stick around. We wanna make sure you can fully engage in this session today. Uh, you'll definitely wanna do that with a subject like this one. But we'll begin, of course, with the housekeeping items, and that's the slides and the recording. We're asked every single time about these. You'll be happy to know that you will get the copy of the slides sent to you directly by donor search. So be on the lookout for this. In the next couple of days, the slide deck will come to you via email. If you don't see it, look in your spam filter, but you'll probably see it pop right up again in the next couple of days. But a lot of the content, of course, will be shared verbally along these slides. And that's why these are all recorded and placed in the Flash Class Library. You can find that by going to, once again, donorsearch.net. You'll find a screen that looks somewhat like this one. And then if you go to the Resources tab across the top of the page, then toggle down to Flash Class Library and click that, you'll find a screen very much like this one. It's the um, it's searchable library of all the recorded videos, again, going back to mid-2016. Lots of great content there. Uh, I think all of it is uh, CFRA credit certified as well. Um, but uh, this session, of course, will be up there in just the next couple of days. So be on the lookout and you can search for it by title, by presenter, uh, and it'll be right there in this wonderful library for you. Now, one of the things that make these sessions special, of course, is that we give you the opportunity to engage with these great presenters. And so we wanna encourage you to do that today. Go ahead and ask your questions anytime uh, or make any comment for that matter by going uh, right to the center of your GoToWebinar control panel where you'll find the questions tab. And that's where you wanna put any question or any comment at any time so I can provide those to our presenter at the conclusion and he can answer them in turn at the end. If there's a real burning issue, I'll try to keep an eye out for that. Uh, otherwise, we'll be providing those at the, at the conclusion of the presentation, uh, which of course is on what's new and on the way in fundraising technology. You read the description of this already, and I know you probably have a million questions that relate directly to your experience either today or what it's gonna be like tomorrow, and we have the right person talking about this, and that is Chris Cannon from the Zuri Group. Um, I actually have known Chris for a long time, so it's really a pleasure to have him here. He's been in the field for over 20 years, and prior to joining Zuri Group, uh, he was managing associate at Ben Swaley Flessner, director of research and development, services at St. Louis University, where by the way, he provided leadership for the $300 million campaign. So it's not just about the tech, but what the tech does. And he knows both ends of the equation. Uh, he was also before that, assistant director of development at the St. Louis Zoo and prior manager of research and records at the St. Louis Science Center. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we go back a long way, especially through the world of APRA, where among other things, he has served as past treasurer and a board member of our favorite association here at Donor Search. He's also the author of a book that if you don't have, you wanna get, and that's the Executive's Guide to Fundraising Operations, published, I believe, by Wiley. But you also find him um, as a speaker in, in various venues, uh, including this one today, but also as an instructor at the Rice University Center for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership. It's such a pleasure to have a friend of the industry, uh, Chris Cannon, here today. Thanks so much for being here, Chris. Well, thank you, Jay, and really delighted to hear your voice. And as you mentioned, Jay and I have known one another, maybe almost all of those 20 years have been in the industry. And I know everyone who knows Jay values the, the role that he has played, as well as the role that Donor Search is playing. Uh, I did not realize there had been 170 of these sessions since 2016. So just that library itself is um, 
pretty substantive. So what we're going to do today, guys, is we're going to talk through the uh, plans for this session and then move into what some of those technologies look like, what you should be hearing about. Um, and then from there, we should be able to uh, get into how do you how do you go get these things? How do you persuade leadership to to buy them, et cetera? Um, so let's see if I can get a slide to move forward here, and we'll we'll start talking about the plan. So overall, for this session, we're going to split it into two parts. We're going to talk about what is out there, and then secondly, how do you go get it, and how do you discern what's really neat and shiny and cool versus what is actually necessary and going to help you raise money and build better relationships. So one of the things I, I show behind this plan for this session here, if you haven't seen this before, this is a, a, a view of the hype cycle, which a group called Gartner has come out with or came out with years ago with, with the notion that we get really excited about new technology and it usually then inflates our expectations to a point where it can actually create some disillusionment over time. Um, because it's maybe not going to fold our clothes and you know be as the next new slice bread, et cetera. So I think it's important that we realize um, as we're thinking about what's new in, in technology, there's always that risk of overselling and under delivering, and we want to do the opposite. So I, I was joking about this uh, with a few folks in my firm um, about what's trending in, in advancement. I thought I would just do one slide and it would just have AI on it, and that'd be it, right? Everybody's into either artificial or augmented intelligence right now. It is everywhere in every session and every every marketing uh, piece, uh, everything that I'm seeing. But of course, it's not the only thing that's trending and, and it's important and we'll talk about that. Um, but it's certainly something that I think is another consideration as you're sifting through what's out there, what's important to your organization is there's a cycle of marketing and buzzwords that will have an impact on what your leadership sees, what they hear about, and therefore what they ask you about. So, you know, think back to um, last year about this time. If you didn't, uh, if you weren't sort of tired of hearing about marketing automation, uh, I'd be surprised because last year was all marketing automation. The year before that, by the way, was all blockchain. The year before that was all BI. The year before that was all CRM. There, there seems to be these these cycles of attention that we focus on new technology, um, and it's not a bad way to do it. And it's sort of how the world works these days. But what I want to do today is not just talk about the one thing um, like AI, but talk about the many things that are likely bubbling up in your shops. Um, and as Jay mentioned, what we're going to do with this session is if, as you have questions, put them in the chat. And if it's uh, germane to the topic, if I haven't described something well enough, et cetera, on a particular slide, I'm happy to handle those as we go. I'm going to try to scoot through the discussion here, uh, the, the slide, so that we can have uh, some more Q&A toward the end as well, so, so you know that. Um, so what is trending in advancement? First and foremost, and this is, I think, a, a big, big shift if you've been in, in the business for two or three decades, we're switching more and more to the notion that our users are customers and that the customer experience is important. Now, we also have constituents, right, our alums, our donors, our um, volunteers, visitors to our museums, all those things. We have those sorts of individuals that are important, um, that, that, are, that are customers, but I'm really focusing a little more on the internal user because those tend to be the requests that we're getting for new technology after I go to that case conference or that outward conference and I see some shiny new thing, hey, we need to go buy that. Well, should we and or should we not and how do we discern this? So for, for instance, a big part of customer experience right now is the question of, the use of video in our in our shops, right? So, should you create videos for your your uh, constituents externally? Sure, of course. You probably have dozens, right? Hopefully, you have your own YouTube channel. Should you be creating video for your internal team for training? Probably. I don't know how many of you are doing that, but we've been for a couple of years now creating 90 to 120 second videos on how do you log in, how do you use this feature, how do you load a, a contact into this system, whatever that system may be. Because our users now are, one, getting sort of younger, if you will, right? They're, they are expecting not to have to read a, a document. They are expecting not to have to look at a manual. They're expecting more and more intuitive systems in, in, in use. And if they don't know how to use it, they're, you know, they're used to going to YouTube to watch a video on how to fix their, you know, their sink. They want to do the same in the office. So we need to be considerate of the fact that our users are getting younger 
and they're all using mobile devices and other tools that are just flat out awesome, right? Your Alexa or whatever you use, if you use a, the Google, you know, wh whichever the devices you use, those things are amazing. You can wake up and say, what's the weather going to be like today? Not touch a thing, go brush your teeth, say, play my favorite music, right? You can ask your iPhone on Siri. Siri will probably be wrong, but <laughs> it's only because I don't like Siri much. Um, but you can ask Siri where the nearest Vietnamese restaurant is, and you'll get an answer. And then you get dressed and you go into work and you flip on the, the, the computer and voila, you've got, you know, 1994 staring back at you, right? The, the systems we have are not keeping up with the user and the, the consumer experiences that our, our colleagues uh, are having on a day-to-day -day, uh, world. And that includes something that I think is really important that we're going to see more and more of in, in the tech or, and or we should be delivering more and more through the tech that we're using for advancement, which is our colleagues are actually getting something out of all this stuff. And it has a lot to do with the notion of gamification, right? That it, it's either you could look at it as the dopamine that our, our brains are sharing when we open up an application and we get excited that there's three likes to something. It's in the way that sound is used for different types of delivered uh, vehicles on your iPhone. All those things are, are Pavlovian kinds of, of triggers designed to make us go, ooh, go look at that. And how many of us have built any of that into an easy way to do a system um, update for a contact report? Maybe if, maybe some of you, and, and if so, please share in the chat, that sort of thing, you know, anything you're proud of or, you know, um, case studies, other things you want us to go look at, be happy to do that. Uh, one university we worked with fairly recently did something pretty smart in this gamification uh, line. They said, okay, we've got this date, this CRM. And by the way, I'm gonna try to be as uh, platform agnostic as I can during this discussion. So um, trust me, the university exists, the CRM exists, and happy to share details uh, offline, I suppose. But so in this particular case, the university said, we have the CRM. What we want to be able to do with it is not worry people about fields they don't need until they need them. And we know what that is because the status of an entry on the proposal form, the opportunity form, whatever, if it says cultivation, they don't know what they're going to ask yet or they don't know the ask amount yet. They don't know the ask date yet. So let's just gray those out. And so from a programmatic standpoint, we can go behind the scenes and say, okay, if status equals this, then these three, four, you know, these three fields must be filled in, but the rest can be grayed out. And then if you move through the, the cycle, as you're moving through the cycle, lo and behold, the user has to fill in certain information, but they're also rewarded by not getting a you know, little red X that says you must fill this in. They're also not having to make up stuff just to be able to close out a form. So these are the kinds of things that, that are universal uh, experiences as consumers are driving. And we need to figure out how and whether as advancement services and systems professionals or anybody else in the line who cares about advancement tech and operations, how do we get to the digital transformation that we need? Many of us know, and, and it's, it's a bummer, that um, I mean, our industry is 10 plus years behind the consumer world in almost every case. And it's important because we're, we're having to negotiate those expectations almost every day, right? So you take an organization like an Amazon, and I, I mean, I can I can promise you once a month, I hear from typically a you know well-intentioned, very thoughtful vice president of development, you know, I wish my database were more like Amazon. And I say, I, I do too. Amazon has 288,000 employees and a, billion, a trillion dollar valuation. How about you, right? It's not a fair fight. We just don't have a ton of, of investment here. We do have enough I and mean, we have some that, that we can work with. And so it's important as we think about the digital transformation we're seeing and what is new and, and neat, that we're also doing it a little bit with an arm tied behind our back because again, Apple, trillion dollar company that sells devices to hundreds of millions of people. And then we're hoping that our databases, it's really, you know, our, our technology really just designed for our sector will we'll come close to the kind of user experiences that, that we're seeing. And again, it's, it's not exactly a fair uh, hype cycle expectation situation, right? We get really excited about cool things, then we go, oh, but 
um, I only have $5,000 to spend in my budget this year. Well, so what do we do about those things? One of those things, and we'll talk about in the second half of this, is then we have to be selective. We have to be smart about what, what we go to and what we get and then how well we implement those things. So uh, a few weeks back, uh, a colleague of mine, Mohammed, um, he and I presented a, a session, a similar sort of session where um, in, in his case, the notion of digital transformation and that is a, an overarching goal has been a helpful rubric to say, you know, we're not there. Um, and we, we can't be there yet for all the reasons that we're gonna, you know, we've been talking about, but we're trying, right? We are, we are trying to get to a point where our level of sophistication, it gets closer and clo closer to matching our customers' expectations. And so the first thing I would say um, about your customers' expectations in the advancement technology space is we need to figure out how to tell all of our users that you already have a CRM. And what I mean by that is that a CRM is your database and probably lots of other things. Maybe it's your database plus lots of other things built into that same application. And so if you have a Salesforce application or, you know, again, Blackbud CRM, some of the, you know, even maybe RENXT, just using some of the, the, the bigger systems, Softrack, uh, Clearview, you can do really anything you want to do in these systems, except there are other bolt-ons and add-ons and things you might want to go buy, and we'll talk about integration in a bit. Um, but what's important here is that in the constituent relationship management space, A, you already have a CRM. And that's a good starting point in negotiating, negotiating with your team, right? They might want a CRM that has better social and external capability, and that's great and maybe fair, um, those things don't necessarily preclude you from saying, but we have a good constituent relationship management system. We track events here, we track online giving here, we track et cetera here and here. And what you'll probably find is things like social data management and other tools are not represented well by your database, your current suite of tools yet. Maybe they are, uh, and if so, again, feel free to chat uh, about what those things are. Um, but it's certainly the case that your CRM is your database and if you can persuade folks of that you can start to release some of that pressure to oh we need a new system because i'll tell you i've had this conversation with lots of folks they're effectively if you raise you know more than 50 million dollars a year um there are three systems that are available to you right now one is salesforce one is blackbud crm and one is advanced crm uh, by lucian there may be some others out there sap doesn't really compete in the space oracle doesn't really compete in the space um, if you're down below 50 million to, you know, five or 10, there's the Blackbods and, and uh, sorry, Blackbod raises edge, there's Banner, there's other systems in that space for sure. Um, Salesforce plays well in that space. If you're below 5 million a year, particularly if you're under a, a million a year, you're starting to look at, you know, the, the Neon CRMs or Sugars or again, Salesforce because of their um, Salesforce organization, Salesforce.org foundation approach, which is, um, you know, all of, all of which are good, but the reality is if you have any of the things I just said, or probably a bunch of others that I didn't, I don't want to list them all, right? But um, any of those are a database that also can serve as a CRM for the most part. And then from there, it's, do you have enough revenue? Do you have enough time, talent, and need to go and get more fancy components to it? So let's talk about some of those fancier components, right? So the first is that you're probably starting to experience a pretty direct um, correlation between your vendor's long-term roadmap and cloud computing. Nearly every vendor in our space is hoping to be a software as a service subscription model uh, if they're not already. And there's something wrong with that. And there are pros and cons, right? You might, with another client of mine uh, down, uh, South, I just had breakfast with them. This shocked me. This is the two two Wednesdays ago, I think. Um, he he told me that his IT team was uh, against cloud computing. They were against offsite hosting because they wanted control and that they would never go to a hosted environment. And at breakfast he, the other day, he said, "You know, we'll probably be in the cloud in the next couple of years because I our IT team just can't keep up. They can't keep up with some of the tech issues or the security issues." the data, the volume issues, you know, spinning up extra instances of a new database, et cetera. All that stuff gets a little bit easier if you don't have to requisition a 
uh, you know, some kind of SQL server uh, that then will house that information and you could just do it in the cloud. So certainly if your team isn't thinking about the cloud yet, start and think about the fact that what we're seeing in the cloud with our clients is that um, the people that used to be managing servers probably can pos transition into things like data integration between applications, which um, is certainly something our, our industry needs and, and could be done better and better for certain. So think of, of cloud computing as something that if it's not already, it's, I know it's on everybody's minds, but if it's not on your roadmap, you, you're gonna run into that fork in the road and the odds that you go toward the cloud are pretty great, so you should be prepared for that. Another thing that um, we all need to be cognizant of, and I put cloud computing first because I think it's it's a big driver for advancement technology, but you know, one thing I, I wanna make sure is really clear here is that there are just some fundamentals about advancement technology that no matter how fancy you get, no matter what kind of cool tech you get, you, you have to pay attention to these things. So um, it starts with great data, right? I was talking earlier today with a, an organization about their engagement scoring. Um, it's a big university, you know, they're in the NCAA tournament, they're, they're curious like who's buying tickets uh, to go to the NCAA, they, they don't know, right? They could, honestly, it's, it's knowable in some way, there's some way to, to go scrape some of that data um, and integrate it, but they, they don't know who's going to these games, boy, wouldn't they like to, because they want that to be factored into their engagement score. Well, it gets back to this notion that no matter how cool your technology is, you, the, the more, more and better data is always a good place to start. A well-trained team is in, essential. Having common processes that are documented, common definitions about how you look at data, all these things are critically important. Again, no matter if you are a million dollar shop running off a neon CRM or you know a $500 billion shop who's just about to implement a, a big new um, application, those things have to be in place. And that includes some governance, right? You need to know who owns and who gets to change and who gets to update and who gets to make decisions about data management and other things. Um, very frequently, we're, as, as we're seeing this progression onto the cloud and this progression of integrating systems, which we'll talk again more about as I keep mentioning, um, what, what we're seeing over and again is that governance is a, a really critical driver that we don't really have a great handle on, meaning um, the number of places that don't have a data standards document that don't necessarily have a MOU or something governing the sharing of data across departments or even uh, organizations in some cases. Um, it, it, it's a problem that, that we're not, not as organized as we could be. So again, going back to these basics, uh, this is where it starts. And so we'll talk about what some of those basics mean. And, and really, I tend to start with having a master data management plan, policy, committee, et cetera. You need some kind of infrastructure on master data management. So all master data management really gets at is that when, to get really good data, you need some responsibility, right? You need assignments, you need to know who handles which thing, what record is quote unquote right and defined by whom. You need to really be thinking about the dozens of, of sources of information that we could be gathering. So I've been in the higher ed space, um, you know, work, work there and a lot of my clients are in that space. So I would have told you five years ago that the golden record, quote unquote, which is the single best way to contact and, and engage a particular constituent, the best way to know who that constituent is, is maybe a better way to state that. Um, the, the advancement team probably has that at least two or three years after graduation, right? The registrar has good information prior to that. These days though, I was just talking to a, a group that is looking at getting third party purchase data for apparel that if they could get that, then they could know, well, who's buying our T-shirts in a way that they need, you know, they, they don't know if it's the right Chris Cannon who just bought that T-shirt. That's really great, a great, it's a great opportunity to integrate data to get more and more information into one place to get a better 360 degree view about your constituents. But who do you even go talk to about, can we accept that third party's data? Who, who's in on that plan for master data management? So if you're not thinking about master data management and the match logic that's required and who's gonna do the quality control and those sorts of things. You need to put this on your list. I just um, had a, uh, I do a lot of my 
writing in LinkedIn these days. So there's an article in LinkedIn about master data management uh, right now that if you want to go look me up uh, on LinkedIn, you can find out a bunch more information uh, related to master data management. But that's something we should certainly be considering. The other thing around master data management, uh, I, I say this um, unfailingly, the better your reporting and data output, the less people care about your technology and data. What I mean by that is if the business intelligence and analytics that you're producing are consistent, accurate, and complete, if they're formatted well, if they have your brand, if they look like they're professionally created on it and they could be run uh, and rerun and get the same answers, right? Little things like that. If you're in that situation, um, then you're gonna have much greater confidence in your systems and you're gonna have fewer requests for new stuff. Um, right now, I would say that, you know, the organization, the organization needs that I'm seeing the, the most, or roughly, um, data visualization. We want Tableau, we want Advisor, we want Click, we want Power BI, or some kind of uh, marketing automation effort, right? That in, in, in both of those cases, you can't do great marketing automation without great data, and you can't do great BI without great data. So it's important to know then that where, where the uh, where the users are heading is when they can where, where they can easily consume data, right? That's no big surprise. Um, are we anywhere close to the ability to have a you know a speech based search in an Alexa format to deliver a result? And the answer on the one hand is yeah, we actually we we've, we've seen organizations create tools like that. Do they give you accurate enough information to then move on? No, not yet. And that's because you can imagine if, if you ask Alexa, hey, Alexa, give me all, all donors who gave $100 last year to the XYZ fund. Um, the formatting of that and in, in, in whether you give enough information to Alexa for, to, to quote unquote create a query um, to then pull the data, it gets a little wonky. It gets a little hard to deliver. And one thing we found, which I, I find kind of fascinating is that, um, you know, if you ask Google a question and nobody goes and looks at page two, right? And you don't get the information you want, you don't get mad at Google. But if you ask your your query writer and your team a question and you don't get the information you were hoping for, uh, you might get a little mad at that query writer. So this is that, um, that challenge that we have in the consumer world, we have a different experience with pulling and requesting data for analytics um, than, than we do in our advancement tech. And it's just a, a reality we have to face. One thing I would suggest is if you haven't looked at Gartner um, and their magic quadrants for things around uh, marketing automation, and this in this case, this is for reporting and analytics, um, this is a good way to get a sense of who's out there in the, who vendor-wise is out there with the best options. And so this does help you a little bit with you know where where you might consider uh, investing time and treasure, which you'll see in the top right hand corner, the, the established options, Microsoft and Tableau. Um, therefore, if you were doing a, a selection, you know that sort of thing, it, not including those two, would be going against the grain in terms of what a, a trusted objective third party group like Gartner is, is suggesting. So certainly, though, business <clears throat> intelligence. Um, and just getting data out of your system, if you don't have a good enough tool for that yet, it doesn't, whatever neat and new is out there is one thing, but you gotta do that first. And then you could get the neat and new thing maybe that's doing that. And you know maybe that's Tableau right now, there are other cool tools that are allowing organizations to, to pull data out and do easy slicing and dicing. Honestly, if you're listening right now and you do not know what a, a, an Excel pivot table is, go Google that watch a video on YouTube about that, and then do those things. Because even that is, is a great start, um, just to be able to, to slice and dice some data. So these are some of the core tools, right? We need, you already have a, you have a CRM in all likelihood. Might need to be better, might need to have some new functions, you might need better reporting, might need a little bit better data management, uh, et cetera. Um, but there are also some things to consider that are external to your database and need, need to start to be part of your roadmap for your advancement tech. And so the first thing to consider is 
what's your what are your social engagement tools right what what is available to you now and you'll see these little red arrows that point to instagram youtube uh twitter facebook this is a quick shout out to donor search jay said we wouldn't talk about it much they're coming uh through with this social discovery tool set um that's one of the the few that's out there that i've seen that um is doing what you need immediately which is Tell me who these like. Give me a good match, and then tell me how I can learn more about their their social behavior. Um, where where we are, where I'm seeing a lot of opportunity in the social engagement, you know, very specifically, are down here. You'll see on this slide here. Um, there there are a couple tools out there that are specifically allowing you to do better social data management and engage both your internal users with better tools and your external users um, with better tools. So what, what if you look at the, the sector specific kinds of tools, we're talking about, you know, what's your online giving functionality look like? And is it, is it as good as it could be? What kind of communities do you allow for? So Salesforce communities is a, a relatively new um, solution in the advancement uh, particularly in the higher ed, but in the advancement space to provide for what has always been, you know, kind of that online community that, the, you know, net communities or iModules or other tools um, that serve that space uh, provide. And you have a, a number of, of email and other specific tools that, um, you know, MailChimp or Emma, that maybe are a little bit better than your delivered database integrated reporting, or sorry, uh, email engine that maybe you should go consider, right? There are some sector-specific engagement tools that that are uh, making a difference. And so um, for online giving, for instance, the sets of giving tools that come with your database or your CRM are one thing, but you might want to go look at iModules or Classy or the ability to, to manipulate Salesforce and Salesforce communities. Um, just as ad additional alternatives and, you know, particularly um, in a way that is increasingly mobile that allows you to, to give, um, allows your users to give uh, as easily as possible. So we've all, you know, online giving is not exactly new. Uh, something that is a bit newer in our market sort of sector specific area it would be how to leverage marketing automation tools. So. Um, I posted something on LinkedIn asking for feedback on what people wanted to hear about in this session, and marketing automation came up more than once um, as something people were were keen on. And so, again, uh, Salesforce Marketing Cloud or Pardot, which integrates well with Salesforce, Marketo is a separate system, Eloqua from Adobe. These are all really interesting applications that allow you to create a constituent journey uh, that maybe is a welcome a welcome path, right? I gave my first gift. I'm going to get this kind of email engagement over the next three to four months um, that hopefully then by studying and allowing for decision tree clicks, you know, if I click here, then I get this kind of messaging. If I click there, I get that kind of messaging. By building out this marketing automation, you can cover very vast groups of your constituency with a plan as opposed to reactively one by one. The commitment to your communication plan for marketing automation tools is really challenging to meet sometimes. It's a, I wouldn't say it's, um, I would say it's it's challenging to meet if, what I put this? It's challenging to meet, not because not because you couldn't do it as an organization, but because you have to kind of let go of a lot of things, right? Who do you let into the path? Who do you let experience that journey? Well, if you don't let everybody, then you have to start making exceptions. You know, some of the exceptions uh, might actually defeat the purpose of having the marketing automation to begin with. How I would start is that your lower level engaged folks, i.e. haven't given a ton, uh, haven't given very often, um, and, and or aren't you know rated very highly, aren't assigned, et cetera. What's the harm, right, in having some kind of journey established and applied uh, to maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of folks and seeing what happens, right, and, and really studying that. That communication plan feedback loop then becomes really important. And I think it's also important to know for marketing automation that this is of the tools that, that I've seen lately, it's the most expensive to spin up and really use and leverage um, at a level that would maybe stretch some budgets. What I mean by that is that, you know, the 
in, in the, the system selections for marketing automation tools that we've been a part of, you know, we don't tend to see anything that is uh, under, you know, let's just say mid five figures to implement. And then you need a staff member or two to actually make it work that you need someone who are pulling the strings and, and tinkering with these things, the, 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 um, the journeys, et cetera, and the way that you're messaging and your communication plan. If you don't have that, then you won't use it very well. And so why bother, right? So just, you know, a word to the wise in this, that marketing automation is great where I don't think it serves you well as if you have 10,000 emails. Um, I think you need to have a constituency that is predominantly email engaged where you have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of emails on your, your constituent list. Because um, if you don't, I, I think it, it creates a real challenge um, to get the value out of it. So then we also have you know, some sort of niche tools right now, like giving day tools or lead generation AI tools, those sorts of things, uh, video for um, thanking people for their giving and those sorts of things that, that I think if you have, um, if, if you're looking for that kind of niche tool, the thing I would start with is, do you have your fundamentals first, right? Do you, do you have your database in, in order? Are your data good? Is your reporting and, and BI environment good? And you kind of work through those things first, because you can, you can really go a uh, whole, and you know, we see this a lot. Um, we, I've seen a number of organizations spend a ton of time on a giving day platform for a year um, and had a great, you know, felt like a great experience, but maybe didn't raise as much as you had hoped, maybe didn't get as many donors as you had hoped, and spent maybe hundreds and hundreds of hours uh, trying to make that thing work, only to pick a new one the next year. Um, and so keep that in mind, right, that that some of these um, engagement generation and niche tools, you really have to have all your other ducks in a row first, and you have to figure out whether you think the ROI is going to be high enough. So we also then sort of lastly in terms of of you know what's cool and neat out there i i'm saving i don't know if it's the best for last i'm saving it for last artificial intelligence right i had a talk with uh david woodruff who's at mit a couple weeks ago uh mit just opened the first school for computing there and it's really designed to study ai the whole campus is um trying to build out strategies for applications of ai depart you know in every department and the way that he put it and i want to give him credit for this is he said he said that ultimately AI should be a one plus one is greater than two. And I looked at him like, well, that's, what do you mean? <laughs> that's pretty deep, right? And what he meant was that if you add a human and a computer, you should get a better outcome than if each one did it separately or they didn't integrate together at all. And I thought that's exactly the kind of augmented intelligence message we're hearing. That's exactly what you want. It's really what, you know, prospect research with screening has been doing for years and years. It's what um, a number, you know, if you've done re any regression analysis to create a model in, in your professional career, you, you've done AI in, in, in its current thinking, right? It's machine learning. It's, they're slightly different, but it's all kind of lumped together these days from a marketing perspective. And so there are absolutely some cool chatbots out there that uh, if you look at a company called Drift, um, I only mention this one because it's free to use and get started on. Um, put a little chat bot and see if people engage with it, right? And see, see if you can get some leads uh, at 11 o'clock at night that you wouldn't have had anybody as a staff on staff to help with anyhow, right? That kind of thing. And then you're going to see companies like a Gravity where they're building in uh, AI into engagement lead generation or other tools. So certainly AI is, it's, it, I would say it's here to stay, but honestly, it's been here since we've been doing, you know, since Jay Frost and, and others were doing uh, the kind of analytics and data screening that they were doing. And Jade, I won't, I, I don't know exactly when you started doing this, but you've been doing it a long time. So, so those are some of the things, and I think the key things to be thinking about in terms of what's coming. Now, how do you make decisions about all of these things? So the first step, and there are eight, the first step here is to really ask yourself, why? Do we really need this thing? And I, I use analogies a ton, right? It's a good way for me of learning anyhow or teaching. Um, so I'm gonna use a little bicycle analogies throughout this, right? That that um, when I was a kid, I, I man, I really wanted to ride in the Tour de France and I, my parents used to always say, and I always wanted the newest bike, whatever came out, you know, I wanted some new, neat, cool bike. 
and my parents would say, well, you know, the tread, the treads in your tires are still pretty, look pretty good. Like you really haven't ridden that bike enough to justify a new bike. And that, that was a good message. I, you know, in, in hindsight, of course, I thought they were idiots at the time, <laughs> but as a parent now, it is someone who thinks about using your, the resources you have to their fullest. It was pretty good advice, right? So right now though, if you have RE7, you got to make a decision soon-ish to go to NXT to do something different. If you have advanced uh, AWA, or if you, I don't, I don't know if anybody's, how many client server advanced users are all the, there are these days, but if you have Banner, if you have Genzabar, your uh, CX or EX, right? Um, if you have a system that's been in place for a long time that is reaching into life, Millennium is an example, you, you need, the why is, well, you know, it's an end of life situation. Um, on the other hand, you might have, the why is that you don't have something that could be pretty helpful. If you don't have any social data management tools, if you don't have marketing automation and you have a market to automate, you have a big enough alumni, you know, a constituent pool and email set to work with. Maybe it's something even more simple. Maybe it's just having a better and, and more efficient um, online giving where you could do some analysis, you know, we through Google Analytics, for instance, to uh, improve how, how your drop-off rates are and, and to get more click-throughs and conversions into gifts, right? So one of the things then that I tend to find is that what you tend to experience with the, the you know, do you really need it, is, you know, your users probably have a point. They might have a bike as old as this one. Uh, they might be able to, to point to the, the end of life of the application or, you know, that the way that, that organization, other organizations, similar organizations are using those technologies. I, I would be really careful though, that you don't just, well, and, and this is so hard as humans, don't use the cases of other organizations as the starting point for your why. And the reason for that is there are best practices for sure in our industry, but you should be focusing on practices that are best for you. And your institution's needs, your budget, your timing, your all those realities are probably gonna be different from that one case study you read about that new super cool thing that you'd like to go get. So if that if that's the reason you want that new bicycle, uh, you might be in a little bit of trouble um, to, to be able to move forward with that. And then another thing to consider in step two here is, can you show or can you deal with your past technology use as a bellwether for what's gonna happen next? This is a, a, a bike that's been unopened, right? That's the, the message here is sometimes we go buy technology to solve a need and they never get used. Or sometimes we view technology as the end in and of itself. And, and in fact, it should have been a means to an end and that end was never realized. There are also related to your past technology use opportunity costs for all of, for all of the things you're looking for. So, you know, will that X tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars um, invested lead to an outcome that is greater than investing that money differently. And I'll give you a quick kind of funny example. The, the university I was working with who was talking to their foundation president, they were thinking about moving to a brand new CRM or building a new building uh, for the foundation team members to, to work in. And, um, you know, guess which one made more sense to the foundation president to do? They already have a database. I had already convinced them that database was more or less a CRM. Uh, and so they built the new building and that made sense to them. The opportunity cost of buying new technology was to not build a building and you know, they were bursting at the seams in, in their old place. So these are important things you've got to, you've got to be persuasive about in presenting that what's next. And therefore one of those what's next is going to be, how do you get better future behavior because of this new technology? And this goes to, the, the notion that you know buying something and implementing something doesn't mean it'll get used. Uh, this is a Peloton. If any of you ever do um, this kind of, uh, we we help Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and some of my colleagues did their cycle for survival a couple weeks ago, and it's all cool, right? And it's you got a lot of gadgets, and you got numbers, and you got metrics all over the place, and all this is designed to amp up your your performance, your behavior, right? Um, that's the promise of the new technology. And you need to be able to sell that and figure out how to package it and also be realistic about it. And again, if you if in step two, you can't show that technology in the past has helped much, then it's gonna be hard to say that future behavior is gonna be that much greater. 
but it could be, hey, the dashboards in this new thing will tell you, the manager, who is uh, doing a great job and who has an opportunity to improve even more, et cetera. So you gotta be realistic about this as you're, you're organizing people in, in their thinking, because um, you don't wanna oversell and under deliver, but you can then hopefully get people to a point where they, they can see that path to a future where you get more gifts and you get better relationships because you have better technology. So step four is a step back once you've done the first three, which is to say very specifically, what is the plan for adopting this thing that you want? Um, if your past behavior has been good, if they're spending the money a different way wouldn't make any more sense, um, if you can see a path in the future where this, this would be used and helped, then you need a plan that is talking about timing, training, the roadmap of those things. And really importantly, and the reason to start with this is you really need a compact, a contract almost, a commitment from all of the folks that are stakeholders in wanting this new thing. Uh, I say this because I've, I've experienced and you know, seen directly an organization that implemented a really great BI tool um, only to find that all the folks that they, they thought were going to become self-service users, they didn't decrease the requests uh, for ad hoc stuff to the advancement services team one, one bit. And in fact, they barely used the new system that much. They kind of looked at one dashboard. So it didn't actually change the behavior. It didn't actually do the things they needed. And they didn't, they didn't have a way to flip that to improve um, the, the buy-in for that, partly because they didn't take some of these steps early on. They just thought, you know, if if we build it, they will come. And, you know, there was a, a movie once. It was about baseball. Um, I don't know if we can count on that necessarily in our in our on our teams because there's just a lot of um, it's a lot of folks. And again, think of your consumer experiences. A lot of folks think they want something. They download that app on their phone and they open it twice, right? So we want to avoid that. One of the ways to avoid that is through this kind of user adoption planning. Step five in making a pitch for what is necessary versus you know, getting rid of what's needed is you need to put some pen to paper and figure out what are the gaps we're trying to fill. That fit gap analysis that you create will be, in my view, the single most important thing to knowing that you've done, you've done a good job. If, you, if your gaps used to be that you know, we couldn't put in contact reports easily, we couldn't use our database on the road, and therefore our gift officers were making fewer visits. Well, after you've implemented, are you making more visits? Can gift officers work remotely, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so also then the total cost of ownership, that's TCO, and the return on investment pieces, those should all be part of your building blocks of your plan, because if you can't write those out, then you're really talking about, I want this thing because it feel, you know, on a hunch, or it feels good, or because the university of or the hospital down the road has this thing and therefore we should get it. Those things aren't nearly as effective as when you can put a pen to paper and, and show this information. By the way, this I, I just happened to see this little picture. That's a little cyclist. This I, I read some of this paper, which was super detailed and boring about uh, oxygen, oxygenation of muscles in bicyclists, and so that's why I included this, right? You, you want data, you wanna be able to then turn back to that data first in your step six to create a business case, and then later to show that it worked, right? So if you never created a business case before, um, I highly encourage you to look at something called the SBAR approach, which is uh, heavily used in healthcare, but it's designed to be very compact, maybe one page, um, for a board, you know, you might need some appendices and so forth, but that's probably all they're going to read anyhow. Um, I don't mean that, but you, you get the picture, right? Uh, short and sweet and to the point, and SBAR stands for the situation, the background, the analysis, and the recommendations. And the reason I, I, I wanted to point this out is that a SWOT analysis is what often becomes a, a business case um, format, but if you think of what the SWOT analysis provides you, it doesn't actually require that you provide recommendations. So I wanna be very specific to say, you know, what do you recommend? Who's your audience? What kind of thresholds do you have to pass for that audience? You might need a 30 page, you know, tree assist in order to, to get what you're looking for. Um, in there you should have some things about timing and resources and, and the likes 
that you'll need in order for be successful. And one of those components to be successful is certainly governance. So before you go out and buy that shiny new thing, who owns it? Who owns the data going into it? Who owns the data going out of it? And in this case, as part, step seven is two parts. Uh, what kind of integration are we gonna have? What kind of, um, again, if it, you know, whatever sorts it is, is there HIPAA related issues, there FERPA related issues to sharing data and information? How are we defining things? Who gets to own those different details? These are all important considerations in building out your decisions on which things to go get, um, including in your governance plan to have a golden record data, master data management component. That's a big, big focus of mine and Zuri's this year is how do we help organizations with their master data management? Because if you start there, then you get better results for reporting and for data integration and all these other things we've talked through. And so lastly, we're getting to a, a, a way to to sell this would in, in the way to persuade folks um, that real adoption doesn't mean we went live. The day of go live isn't is not the day you should be measuring your success necessarily. Real adoption gets at long term user satisfaction, user uh, penetration, frequency of use, all those things, and so. I took this as a funny picture for that, that specific reason because this is a, something called the hotter than hell race in uh, North Texas. It's 82 degrees at 8 a.m. on a Saturday and all these poor people decided to come out and ride their bikes anyhow, right? They all have helmets on, they're all organized, they're, they're following the rules, they're doing all the things that you want, you know, from a governance perspective, et cetera. You know, you can go down the line of, of the way that, this is really like a, just a microcosm what adoption looks like. So. Are your users actually logging into the system? Are they remembering their passwords because they log in often enough? These are things that are fundamentally important to being able to persuade folks that your, your path on steps one through seven should lead to this number eight of real adoption. And without that, um, again, it's, it, this technology is a means to an end. And if it doesn't help you raise more money or build better relationships, then you're gonna have a hard time selling it to begin with. So these are some of the, the thoughts that I think are most important in helping us take, whether it's AI applications, social data management applications, other opportunities in our, in our um, advancement technology space. These are things that, while there are lots of cool things out there, um, going from you know, what's necessary and, and sifting out the what's just neat, you have to be smart, and if, I think if you follow these eight steps, it's a way to distill from all the great, and there are a lot of great vendors out there with really cool things, um, but is it for you or not? I think going through this eight-step process will help. I see that Jay has uh, posted a question about questions, and so I'd be happy to respond to those. I don't know, Jay, if you want to jump in. I, I don't know what I get to see or what you get to see. <laughs> sure. A absolutely. Thank you so much. Chris, before we uh, go in and and, uh, and encourage people to go ahead and, and post any other questions or comments they might have, uh, do you have a slide that has your contact information? Chris? Yeah, that was it. Jeff, I dropped the mic. I was just done. No, um, oh. I... <laughs> I do. Let me, I need to, the slide. There we go. Let me advance this slide there. There we go. Um, yeah, actually, just a quick aside here. If anybody knows much about cycling and the Tour de France and everything, it, it, we've been hard pressed to find a, a, um, a hero, right? It's like they're all doped up and you get these, you know, Lance Armstrong was like everybody's uh, favorite. And you're like, oh, well, but he's a cheater. So I had to use a hockey guy to make my final point, which I was bummed about. Um, which is a lot of what I appreciate everybody's time here today because a lot of what we're talking about is that you know you you have to do great data management work you have to shovel the sand on the beach to keep everything kind of looking good and, and organized um, but you're gonna have to look up and look out and see what's out there and go there uh, rather than it coming to you necessarily so I think that's a, a good final message here that as you're thinking about the future of advancement technology um, some of that will come to you because vendors are providing it over time, but you're going to have to make some decisions about what to go out there and get. Sure. 
and actually maybe it's a, a, a great analogy is the fact that you've got all these great cyclists but sometimes it's difficult to find the the person who's done it the way you'd like them to do it and then you had to go to a different field entirely sort of like yeah. you're talking about amazon everybody wants to be like amazon but they haven't put in the money or the time um which a, a leads me to a question but before i ask it i, I want to go ahead and prompt anyone i know we're close to the top of the hour but if you have a question or a comment go ahead and post it if we don't get to it um of course those will be passed to chris you have Chris's information right there, as you can see, right on the screen, so go ahead and take it down. Um, but I also, just as a reminder, want to tell everybody that a copy of the slides will be sent to you via uh, donor search, so be on the lookout for that in your email in case you missed that uh, information before. And a recording of this session will be posted under the resources tab in the Flash Class Library, so you won't have to worry about missing this. And, and uh, you can use this to actually share those, those big key steps, those eight points, um, with colleagues in the office where, it, you know, hitting those final points about real adoption and governance is so tied to the people who may not be sitting with you right now uh, that maybe this recording will be even more valuable um, when you're sitting with them. Um, but uh, we do have a question here from uh, Sarah. She mentioned that you would briefly cover databases based on organization sizes really early on, but she didn't catch it all. And I, I know you went quickly over that. Um, for example, five million to fifty million dollar organizations using um, uh, platforms like Blackbot or or Banner or Salesforce. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit more about where you find systems uh, it, well correlated with organizational size or or ambition? Yeah, so a couple ways to look at that. One is um, what can an organization afford, right? So if you raise less than a million dollars a year, there's a good chance that your technology budget is tiny, right? Maybe uh, $10,000, $15,000 a year, um, in which case you're probably best suited to go with a cloud-hosted, maybe free, depending on how many rows you have, uh, constituents you have, application. And like a Neon CRM is, is an example of something that um, I've used uh, for pro bono clients in St. Louis that um, they just they needed something better than Excel, right? Um, mm -hmm. Once you get into that $5 million or so level, you tend to be able to persuade your uh, board to get a, 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 a more sophisticated set of technology. And so like a Blackboard Razor's Edge or a banner as part of your university setting, uh, Millennium, uh, you know, back in the day, these days maybe Donor Perfect or Softrack, uh, Clearview, those sorts of things tend to be used by, by groups in that you know under $50,000 range. Salesforce would, would be in there too. After you're over the $50 million a year plus mark, then you tend to have a level of sophistication and customization that you need not a, a special set of technology per se, but you want it and you probably want to be able to, to build in some uh, configuration, customization, bolt on and, and you know through data integration, some other applications. And so those tend to be right now again the the if you you know look at system selections uh, happening around the country it, it tends to be Blackbud CRM um, Salesforce Lucian's Advanced CRM which is in the Microsoft Dynamics platform those tend to be the most predominant likely choices at those levels and that's partly because all those are you know seven figure implementations so if you don't raise enough money you can't really justify paying that much for an application. Right. Now, I, I know that you, you talked about this kind of layering of generations of different, um, sometimes it's uh, it, it's approaches or new technologies, but sometimes it's also just a different way of calling things by a new name um, and, uh, and, you know, ending up with AI. I'm wondering how much of, of these decisions are being brought by boards who are seeing bright and shiny objects and they say, we really should do this because it's new, and how much of it is coming from uh, needs the organization to evolve and adapt to technologies that will help it to become uh, more efficient, more effective. Uh, where, where are the pressures coming from as you work with clients in terms of moving from one platform to another in order to be better? Are they, are they real or are they imaginary? Yeah, so five years ago, it was almost all board driven because you know Jane was the CEO of a company that was spending maybe $500,000 a year on Facebook ads, right? Or whatever, like Jane's company was doing all this cool stuff. Why is it, you know, my alma mater? Now what I'm seeing is it's it's internally bubbling because we're getting increasingly sophisticated internal consumers, right? That that picture of that little fellow with the college, I mean, he, he wants everything mobile. He wants everything 
um, yeah. self-service, et cetera. So I think that's, it is, it is a more, more internally driven uh, need and it's coupled by then, you know, the leadership supporting that. Again, the, the, the question to me isn't, is it a good idea? It's, do you have the rest of your house in order yeah. in order for that? It's, it's like building the pool in the house when you haven't redone your kitchen, right? That, right. that uh, you got to prioritize those things. Yeah, it's funny because this whole best practice discussion, which comes up time and time again on every single decision, especially when it comes to the use of of, uh, of these platforms, either the ones we have or the ones that we're thinking about adopting. Um, I, I wonder sometimes if people are using uh, adoption of a, of a new platform or a new technology as a way of avoiding the underlying issue. You know, so in other words, are people still relying on tech to do the things they're afraid or unwilling to do since they many still don't do contact reports, even though many of the platforms you discussed uh, have some facility to integrate a contact report or even going back to screening. You, you, we've been doing it for over 20 years, but I have rarely seen written plans for screening. Maybe you're seeing more of that now. Um, yeah, so no, it's, and, and that's, that's part of my, like I, I say this sometimes, Jay, I'm, I'm the most curmudgeonly fundraising technology consultant about fundraising technology that I know because I'm like, well, wait a second, if people don't use the damn thing, then who cares, right? And I think we we are seeing uh, because we're getting some better investment, we're getting some cooler, it, it, you know, things are way cooler than they used to be. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it, that's what's ratcheting up some of that internal desire for it. But it doesn't change the fact that if your vice president of development does not put his or her contact reports and proposals into the system, you cannot get any kind of forecasting reporting out of that shiny new BI tool you have, right? Like that. That behavior trumps the technology in a way that um, I, you know, I'm constantly harping on. So it's a little bit of my reticence around, you know, AI. I don't mean too dismissive of it because I do think over time it will have an, an important impact. But you know, the the AI that that people are hoping for is based on, you know, Amazon level data availability. I mean, Amazon knows every click I've ever made on their database, right? They know everything I've ever bought. They know all this stuff, and they still don't know me, right? They they can guess better than, you know, uh, a researcher might. So th that's that's my my what I constantly wrestle with is as long as you have your fundamentals in place, you can get fancy. But I to your point, I too often see organizations that you know contact reporting is either you know inconsistent or episodic in a way that means all the other ancillary things, right? You can't have a great uh, marketing automation plan with a, a constituent journey. If you don't follow that plan, some of which is going to have to be a person reaches out and makes a phone call or whatever, right? Then at some point he will get involved. So, you know, and, and just kind of maybe as a final question um, uh, for today, anyway, uh, I know that you've been um, methodical in suggesting the right steps to take so that people are uh, aware of where they've come from, what they're trying to do today what tools and, and approaches will be useful to getting that job done after they've been really thoughtful about it, um, rather than being astrological. But but ne nevertheless, I, I wanna ask you kind of a horoscope question, um, which is you, you are seeing uh, things, and AI is, is the latest of these, uh, to come online that are uh, predictive in new ways. Maybe they're not as predictive as we'd like them to be, but they are here. It's what, when you look out at those things that are really, really kind of exciting to you personally, if you had gone through all these steps, all eight, and you knew your organization was really ready to adopt something new, what's one of the things you see coming online, which is kind of like the, uh, I don't know, the rocket from Musk that's going to take us to Mars? What's that version for development that you think is out there that you, you're really excited about personally? I think a trusted match logic between social data and our golden record mm -hmm. is uh, the, what we should, it's the reason we should get a golden record and have master data management in place. It's the reason we should get our house in order because then we know if someone is engaging, you know, there's soft likes, right? There's this whole notion around, you know, how meaningful is social data because um, mm -hmm. how easy it is to click like. But if somebody's clicked like on cystic fibrosis seven times in a row and you're not asking them to give a gift to cystic fibrosis, that's that's a miss, right? right? Um, I did, did a quick exercise, to quickly say this, I did an exercise with a children's hospital on just this thing. All I did was I, I went through, it happened to me on cystic fibrosis, I just scrolled through three or four of their posts and I found the first person that looked like 
a uh, major principal gift donor, which meant uh, an older person with gray hair, right? And so it was, you know, a lot of a lot of moms and dads who had kids, you know, younger profile picture. And finally, I saw a profile picture of an older gentleman open it up. And this was in about, you know, 35 seconds, open it up. And, you know, this is so anecdotal, but the, within 10 more seconds, I figured out that he owned two companies in this particular state. Each company is worth about 25 million bucks. You'd be proud of me with my research days. And, you know, sure enough, here's a person who probably has eight figures of resources who has clicked on something to, did my client know it? They didn't. And they didn't because they didn't have any master, they didn't have any way to know this guy is actually that guy in the database. He was in their database. And so working toward that integration to me is super exciting. It's also going to be, it's going to be messier than we're used to advancement record management being, which I think is an important aside. Um, in talking um, with David Lawson maybe three years ago about some of the cool stuff he was doing, he said, well, you know, our match rate's about 80%. I'm like, you know, if I took a 20% fail rate to most of the VPs, they, they don't act on that data in advancement. They want better data matching than the industry was able to do. And that was a couple of years ago. So it's good as we can match that, those records up better and better, that, that I think then gives you actionable ways to approach constituents uh, to give gifts and build relationships. And that's what we're all about. Wow, well, that's, that's, a, that's a great way to end. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, for all of this. Really do appreciate it. Um, and, and again, everybody, take down Chris's contact information right there on the screen. Do check out Zero Group. Um, it's, a, it's a big group doing this stuff for organizations of lots of different sizes. I don't want to um, you know, suggest that everybody is going to be the right fit for the kind of work that you all do, but there's a lot to be learned from it and, um, and obviously from Chris himself. So we really appreciate his, his being here today. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Jane. Thanks to Donor Search for putting this together. I appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank, of course, Donor Search for providing us the platform uh, for all these sessions. We really do appreciate it. And uh, of course, Hannah Krobach as our producer, making sure everything is running appropriately and that you can hear every single word uh, that is being spoken. That's invaluable. I want to remind everybody that we do have a session coming up next week. That's on Tuesday, April 2nd at 3 p.m. Eastern. And that's on the internet evolution revolution. This is by a person that, in fact, Chris probably knows. And I know Mark Longo and his colleague, Anna Prushinska garcia who will be talking about, again, that really, really important and interesting subject. So join us again next Tuesday at 3 p.m. for that. Uh, once again, this is uh, an, uh, in our session of Flash Classes, and uh, we encourage you to go and look for this session um, and share it with your colleagues right there in the Flash Class Library. And uh, so until next time, this is Jay Frost speaking. It's been wonderful having you. We'll see you soon. Take care.